Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to talk about attention to detail in the kitchen. Stay tuned. Now, before we get started, just a little update. I'm still writing a book, Bad Cooks Everywhere, but I also started writing a free ebook that I'm going to come out with hopefully within a week or two, maybe even less by the next episode, I'll have it up. It is titled The 50 Most Important Chef's PSAs. I did a Twitter thread on it, on what I think are the most important chef's PSAs. I've also done a podcast on it, but I wanted to write a free little ebook for you all something to give back, something that you could take with you in the kitchen and use it for your pre-shift, or it could be your secret weapon. Anyway, I'm working on that. I'll show you the cover here. If you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, you can see it. My last podcast episode was on 2024 food trends and predictions. I'm curious what you all think 2024 is going to bring. So go back and listen to that episode and let me know what you think. Also, if you want to support the show, make sure you leave five stars. If you're listening on Spotify, Make sure you subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, share it with a friend. Let's grow this podcast. The whole purpose of this podcast really is to help you get better, to help cooks get better. And for a lot of chefs, you should be giving this podcast to your cooks so they could get better faster. The whole idea was to give access to a lot of chefs, cooks, culinarians that don't have access to chefs. So I figured, let me... Let me be the chef that will talk to you and give you the the real, the information that no one else is sharing with you. Today's episode is all about attention to detail, why it's important, what separates great chefs from the pack, and usually what it boils down to is attention to detail. Now, here's a quick story. Early on in my career, when I was in culinary school, we were working on marinating chicken. My chef, Kirk Bachman, who now runs Escoffier schools at the time, he was my chef instructor. He was, I was in his first class, Culinary 101. I was his first student. He was my first chef instructor. And we've remained friends since. But the project that we were working on was marinating chicken. And he gave me this big bowl of chicken. And I was reluctant to get my hands in. I don't know why, but early on in my career, like raw food kind of grossed me out. I didn't come from a cooking background. I didn't even necessarily want to become a chef early on in my career. So The idea of putting my hands on slimy chicken kind of grossed me out. And chef was watching me and he said to me, got really close. He whispered in my ear and he said, the sooner you get over it, the sooner you'll get better. And what was interesting about what he said was what he meant was as soon as I stopped being afraid, as soon as I started being brave enough to touch the food and not being afraid to take on the difficult work, the sooner things would get easier. And it's a lesson that stuck with me for a long time. During that time in my culinary school years, I also worked in a kitchen and I worked as a pastry assistant, but occasionally I would help out in the garde manger kitchen. And these were the old days of the garde manger kitchen. This was the time when you had Sunday brunch with mirrors and on the mirrors, we used to put pâtés and terrines. I could still smell the vinegar that we used to have to wipe the mirrors down with. And we'd have these extravagant buffets with croquembouche, all types of cakes. I used to have to make, I don't know, like 20 or 30 cakes for Sunday brunch the salmon displays, the salmon Kubiak, the beef wellingtons. We had to do it all. But I remember specifically in the garde manger kitchen, you know, we used to do a lot of chauffeur and aspic work. And I remember having to make different colors of aspic and pour different colors and make flowers in the chauffeur, different garnishes. We used to make birds out of all sorts of fruit, like uh, pineapple birds and melon birds and apple birds. It's funny, I think you could pretty much turn any vegetable into a bird. We used to make little penguins out of hard-boiled eggs and black olives. And the thing was, is we put so much care and attention to detail into these things that people wouldn't eat. It was just for garnish. It was just for the show. But back then, Sunday brunch was a big thing. Everyone would dress up. Everyone would go to Sunday brunch. And you had to have so much attention to detail on all these things that were going into it. Things that necessarily did not matter. But they did teach me a certain skill set. Fast forward a few years. I'm working in a kitchen. I'm the saute cook, and we had to flute mushrooms. We used to make these mushrooms that would go with the steak, so every steak had to have two or three mushrooms on it, and I got pretty proficient at fluting mushrooms. It was pretty interesting because I thought I was okay, but there were chefs in there that would blow me away. The chef would flute mushrooms with a 
cleaver or a big old chef's knife, and they were fast and efficient at it. We had to tournay everything. The carrots, the potatoes, whether it was tournay potatoes or chateau potatoes, everything was getting turned. Everything was getting cleaned. We used to make little red potatoes look like mushrooms where we had to scoop them out with Parisian scoops. And all of this was just so it would look pretty on a plate. There was, sure, the purpose was so that it would cook evenly. There was a lot of waste involved back then. Stuff would get thrown into stock or vegetable puree, but you would put so much effort just to make something look pretty, right? What they deemed pretty, the fluted mushroom or the turned vegetable, whatever the case may be. And so much of my early years of cooking was all about attention to detail and learning all these very intricate skills, learning how to make the omelet, as they say, the French style omelet that had no curd and no color on the bottom of the omelet and, and practicing a certain way or deboning a chicken a certain way. All of these techniques, you gained skill and proficiency. Now, fast forward a few years, I started working under a chef who was very much involved in the American Culinary Federation and competitions and everything he taught me was all about attention to detail. So I had a certain amount of skills, but all of a sudden working under him, those skills started to evolve. They started to change because he was more in tune with how clean you work. He came from a, a competition background. It was very competition mindset focused on translating those competition skills into the skills that I use daily in the kitchen. What he used to drill into my head was that the competition makes you better. It elevates your game. You push yourself to a new level and it's hard to go backwards. So you're constantly plussing your skills and improving. And his big thing was attention to detail. Everything was attention to detail. And he was an ACF certified judge or is an ACF certified judge. And he would proctor a lot of the examinations for certified executive chef and so on. And so I was, as a young chef, and I was surrounded and immersed in this environment of culinary competitions and certified master chefs and certified executive chefs, and always looking for a small little detail here and a small little detail there. Now, what did that do for me later on in my career is pre-social media, because now I think with social media, a lot of the attention to detail is coming back. You're able to notice certain things. But back then, if you didn't work in that type of kitchen, a lot of the details were getting lost on you. So why should you care about attention to detail? One, because the more attention to detail you have, the better chef you will be. The way you work when no one is watching is almost more important than when someone is. When someone's watching and they want you to do a certain thing, the chef walks in the room, everyone buttons up, everyone does it the way the chef wants it. As soon as the chef walks out, the standard changes. That happens in a lot of kitchens. It shouldn't, but it does. That's the reality. But if you could be the person that maintains the integrity and in the way that they cook when someone is watching and also when someone is not watching, that's what makes you better. I used to brunoise onions or potatoes or whatever the case may be, and I would try and do it perfect for myself and for the guest. Sometimes I would even make things more complicated than they needed to be as long as I had time to do it because I knew it would sharpen my skills. Little things like practicing canals or piping skills. Whenever I happened to be interested in at the moment, I always wanted to get a little sharper at it. Even though we didn't serve fluted mushrooms, I would still stand around and flute them when I had time or tournay potatoes because I didn't want to lose these skills. The interesting phenomenon with chefs is when you've worked at a very high level, you notice things that people don't notice. I, I think about the documentary Jiro Dreams of Sushi, where the guy who had to wash rice for like 80 years before he was ever allowed to make make fish and the other guy would massage the octopus. And it was things that maybe if you were trying it for the first time, you might not notice things that get lost on people, but I'm sure they notice a thousand small little details that the other sushi chef doesn't do correctly. When you do something at the highest level, you notice little things that get lost on the majority of people. And why do we do it? I don't know. I think it's a, it's a great way to express yourself through your technique, through the craft. There's something beautiful about the precision of cooking when everything is just technical, beautiful, and delicious. And all three of those things have to work together. Technically, sound, knife cuts are perfect. The sear is perfect. When you're cutting the meat, you use perfect technique so there's no saw marks. It's just one smooth cut. The sear is beautiful. You've blotted the meat on a towel so it's not bleeding on the plate. You've let it rest properly. And when I'm working with cooks and I'm looking for attention to detail of what they do. So I put people through a cooking test normally when I hire them. And it's pretty basic. And I've talked about this previously. I normally give them a whole artichoke, a whole fish, a lobster, a chicken, 
and I watch, and I watch how they set up their cutting board. I watch the placement of their knife. I watch, do they wipe their blade in between cuts? Do they sanitize their board in between projects? When they're working with the fish, do they have it on ice or do they not? Do they work fast? Do they scrape the bones for tartare? Are their slices perfect? When they butcher the chicken, do they go for the oyster or do they skip it? When they French the bone, is there still meat on it or is it perfectly clean? When you clean the lobster, do you trim it up or not? Do you pull the feather out of the claw? Do you remove the gills before you turn it into sauce? All these little things matter. And the higher up you go, the more of those things that you do. I went to dinner with a couple of different chefs. Myself, one chef who was a one Michelin star chef and another chef who had worked in a three Michelin star restaurant. And we went to this great restaurant and it was interesting because the one Michelin star chef was able to pick things out and the three Michelin star chef was able to pick things out even more so than the one star guy. It was the difference of, we'll use peas as the example. One person blanches their peas and they're beautiful. The other person blanches their peas and then shucks them. So you have double shucked peas and they're also beautiful. And the third person blanches them, shucks them, and then sorts them by size. So not all, only are they beautiful, but they're all the same size. And that's the attention to detail the further down the line you go in cooking. Does it make a difference? It depends on what you need it for, right? You don't want to triple shuck peas for something that it's not going to matter. Maybe you work in a busy restaurant and that's something that you shouldn't do. But even if you work in a busy restaurant, attention to detail is still there. Let's say you're cooking a hamburger. Do you season it correctly? Do you turn it correctly? Don't press the burger. Don't press out the juices. Maybe we're just talking about a steak. Like I said, did you let it rest properly? And then how do you set up your station? Do you fold your towels? Do you change your bane water? You have to ask yourself, are you doing things the best that you could do them? Or are you doing them the best that they can be done? And there's nuance in that statement. The best you can do it or the best it can be done. If you want to be excellent, if you want to be the best, you want to do it the best it can be done. You want to look at the benchmark of the way it's being done and how can you improve upon that or at least attain that. The best you could do it might be a limiting belief because you think you can't do it better, but I promise you, you can. Because when you're building a team, you want people that have attention to detail and can follow directions. And not just follow directions, but follow them on the smallest details. Not following directions on simple things means you're also probably not going to follow directions on big, important things. And when I would go to cooks and say, why didn't you do this? And they got a million excuses. Oh, well, this happened or this happened. It's like the excuse doesn't affect the outcome. If the outcome that you want is perfect food executed correctly every single time, then the details have to be in place for your food to get from A to Z. No decisions are arbitrary. Everything should affect the final product. So I'm going to encourage you to go back and look at your station and think how you could get 1% better. Is it the way that you cut with your knife? Is it the way that you organize your workstation? Is it the difference between peeling your tomatoes when they're blanched versus learning how to peel them when they're not blanched? When you're making your omelet, how to get no color on them? And how to do all these things very efficient and fast? Right? Because the more you work perfect with good technique and good habits, you will also carry those good habits with you when you're fast. That doesn't change. I like to say I always work the same. Whether I'm in the shits or I'm not, my towel remains folded. My station remains clean. It was funny. I did a video a long time ago on social media. I showed a station setup. Someone asked me if I could do a video on how I set up my workstation. So I did it from home. I said, okay, my board goes here. My knives go here. My utensil band goes there. My towels are folded there. I roll my apron like this when I leave my workstation and someone commented, let's see how your station looks when it's busy. And I said, I've worked at the busiest places. I promise you in the biggest markets and my stations still look like that because it doesn't change. It doesn't matter how many covers I'm doing. I work the same way all the time. And if you work that way, you understand it is possible, but it's people that have never pushed themselves that don't understand that it is possible. Like they say, the only thing that you truly believe is that which you act on. If you truly believe it can be done, you will do it. Now, I will say that this is sometimes a double-edged sword. I've had people that work for me. And if you've ever worked for me, you'll know, like the whole reason, the whole chef's PSA thing is like, I have a thousand standards for almost everything. And it, the list keeps growing. I'll see something. I'll be like, that's good. I'm going to add that to my, my work habit, or I'm going to make that a new standard. And so people that I've worked with me, it's like tape short, fold the towels, station clean, knife goes here, cake tester should be used like this. And there's so many small details that I teach people that work with me. 
And then they go somewhere else and then they're like, why are you doing all that? That doesn't matter. It's busy. We're in the shits. You know, then they put their cell phone on their cutting board and they're like, no, don't ever put your cell phone on your cutting board. That's where you scroll on Instagram and chef's PSA on the toilet. Don't do that. And they're like chef's PSA is not here and it ain't where you from. It's where you at. But I think as much as a place can have an effect on you, you can also have an effect on a place. But, but don't ever do that at the expense of hurting service, hurting your team members, hurting the guests or anything like that, right? You don't want to have a full rail of tickets and say, hold on, let me fold my towels. No, you want to make sure you're putting the food out, right? So some common sense is required. I'm thinking about this no true Scotsman fallacy. So the no true Scotsman fallacy for chefs would be like all chefs all good chefs fold their towels. And then someone's going to say, well, I know a chef that doesn't. And then it goes back to, well, like I said, all good chefs fold their towels. It's like moving the goalposts every single time. And is that true? No, it's a, it's a way to poke fun at things. But I do think that if you want to achieve the highest levels and if you want to get the best out of yourself as a chef and out of your team, if you want to achieve greatness, which is not easy and greatness isn't for everybody, it's all about the details. Success is the sum of a thousand little details done correctly, right? So that's what you need to do. Start paying attention to the details and I promise you, you will become a better cook and chef for it. You could always remove them, but I promise you, you will be better for it. We're gonna keep it short. If you wanna support the show, go to chefspsa.com. You get all the books, all the merch, including this happy cook hat, chef's PSA hoodies, magic chef juice, water bottles, free eBooks, they're also in Spanish and Italian for those of you that read in different languages. Make sure you leave five stars. See you next week. Hit the porno music.